<laughs> so this is part of why you see this cyclical motion behind the cross is, is the idea of that cycle because I really feel like it's key in, in God's timing and also a lot of the teaching that we give in the Possessing Your Vessel class talks about how you need to break cycles and Trisha just mentioned what she'll be sharing on this Monday night, tomorrow night is generational curses. There's a cycle of behavior that can be inherited in our family line. And you might think, now once I became a Christian, all that's gone. You know, our, our experience as pastors for now, you know, 35 years of total ministry time, 22 as pastors, is you're, you're a new creation when you get saved, but you're a baby, right? You're on the milk, and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with being on the milk, but God doesn't want you to stay on the milk, right? If you have a 20-year-old child, you don't want them in diapers, well, drinking a bottle. We're expected to grow. We're expected to mature. So there could be things that are still holding on because they might have a legal right to be, be hanging on to us, okay? Uh, another day's teaching, but just understand that that's a core principle for us, that just because you're saved and you're a Christian doesn't mean you still shouldn't be working through a sanctification process. We are being transformed into the image Yes, you took on his image when you got saved, but now there's that working out of our salvation. Now there's that going from the milk to the meat. And you could be a meat eater in one area, but still be drinking the milk over here. Okay, so there's different parallel things, and that has to do with this cycle idea that I'm going to try to touch on today. Uh, it is finished, and you know that probably, you would know that that comes as the last words that Jesus spoke when he was on the cross. It's not the last words of his in the Bible, because the resurrected Jesus is talking too, right? Um, so that would have been, you know, today uh, being the day of the resurrection, he appeared to Mary in the garden, and then he appeared on the, on the road to Emmaus, and then he saw the apostles later that day, and, and it, it looked like him, but it didn't look like him. Remember, he was able, like, to cloak himself almost, and his body had different characteristics because he didn't come in through the door when he saw the apostles. He just showed up. Now, the thing you should get excited about that is is that when our bodies get resurrected, we're going to have similar attributes, yeah. right? We're not going to be bound by, you know, the gravity problem that life brings. <laughs> you know, gravity eventually wins in this world because, you know, out of dust we were formed and out of dust we returned. And, you know, I won't talk about gravity along the way, but it's not pretty, I promise. Um, so it's always trying to pull us down, right? And Jesus saying, no, I'm giving you a better law. You have a law of lift. Though the outward man is perishing, the inward man is being renewed and restored day by day. So in John 19, this is when Jesus is on the cross. Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. They filled a sponge with sour wine and put it on hyssop and put it to his mouth. And when Jesus had received the sour wine... He said, say it with me, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. And, and I'm guessing a lot of you have studied this in one way or another, if you've been a Christian any length of time. What was finished? Right? There's so many things that we can look at about what was finished. And on the surface, I think the answer most of us should have been taught was that the debt that mankind owed to God for the sin that we lived in was paid. Paid in full. Right? No more. There's no bill. There's no open uh, billing cycle, right? You get the bill in the mail, it says zero balance. Nothing owed anymore. Your sin was paid for by Jesus. And therefore, you should be very grateful about that, right? Now, but think about it. It doesn't mean you never sin as a Christian because you will still sin. There's going to be times that you'll drop the ball. That's not a negative confession. That's just understanding that we have to mature in the Lord. And if you judge somebody, that could be a sin, right? And we're very uh, reluctant to think that we might be judging somebody, but our actions often would, would indicate that we are. Not my job to decide that. That's up to you. But to the point is, we got delivered from the nature of sin so that when it happens as a Christian, you're much more aware of it now, right? You remember when you first got saved? It's like, oh boy, that's illegal. I'm in trouble. Because <laughs> you just got so used to doing things a certain way. And now the Lord is saying, no, I have a better life for you. And it might take some time to break those old habits. So we'll talk about what he might have meant when he said it was finished. But I also want to just still connect it to the Passover feast that the Jews were celebrating. And there could be parts of the gospel that seem confusing when Jesus would say to, to people that got healed, don't say anything to anybody. You'd be like, why not? Why, why wouldn't you want to tell them about this 
great healing that happened. And it's because this cycle had to finish on Passover. Jesus had to go to the cross on Passover in order for the full effect to take, to take place that he understood. So, you know, there's, if you're not totally sure about something in the Bible, it's probably because there's a deeper level meaning that's yet to be revealed. And that's okay. But this is what he saw. Uh, John, actually, his cousin, John the Baptist, was the cousin of Jesus. And way back in John chapter 1, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Well, that's a lot of revelation, isn't it? For that prophet, John the Baptist was a prophet. And he could see way in advance that his cousin was the Lamb of God. What does that mean? They would bring a lamb to sacrifice at Passover. And, and that's what they ate in Egypt before they left. The blood was on the door. Boom, we're going. We're out of here, right? The death angel passes over, and they go. So that lamb represented the sacrifice that they were bringing. Not a broken-legged lamb. And that's why if people try to contend with you about Jesus uh, having an equal, as, as Tricia said, he has no equal, right? He was the Son of God. He was God in the flesh, and he was also fully human. If he had sinned, it wouldn't have been the perfect sacrifice. So he lived 33 years without sin. First time that had ever happened. Only time it ever has happened. And that's why it was so effective when he came out of the tomb, because he had lived through a cycle of life without ever sinning. And that broke the cycle of death. So you see this picture. You see how dramatic it is? Like, boom, it's finished. Everything that happened in the past, all that prior cyclical stuff that was pulling you down, that's finished. The cycle of death is broken. And now you have the ability to step into a cycle of life. And when I say the ability, it has to be your choice. It doesn't happen automatically. And that's part of being transformed part is that Jesus said that we have to pick up our cross daily and follow him. It's not his cross, it's our cross. And anybody that's been saved any length of time knows that just because you know that something's true in your head doesn't mean it's translated down into your body yet, right? And often when you're fasting, that will be some of the times that the, the things that are most fleshly about you, that, 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 are, that are not godly, will surface. And that's a really good reason to fast, isn't it? Unless you just don't want to face it, and that's, you know, that's up to you. See, because if you don't face it, you're just going to live with that thing longer. But So you can either have the pain of the discipline of dealing with it or the pain of regret for not dealing with it. I'd rather have the pain of the discipline personally. That's, you know, what each one of us has to decide. And you should be open to other people if they say, you know, I don't know if you realize how you're coming across. I think you think it's coming across this way, but you might want to pray about this. That's a really valuable thing to have in your life. Don't get defensive about that. Just say, sure, I mean, you're right. I hadn't thought of it. Let me pray about it, right? That's a, that's a healthy sign of maturity when you can do that. And, and why wouldn't we want to be the most effective ministers for Christ? Because if something's holding us back and there's parts of our character that still need redeeming, right? We've been redeemed. We're going to heaven if we die because we accept Christ. It's not has nothing to do with your salvation. It has to do with the effectiveness as a minister. And that's what blows people out of the water when they find out about a famous person living in sin. And we could just say it, right? Rabbi Zacharias' uh, issue right now is a very, very difficult one to, to wrestle with. And, and part of what's difficult is if he could be literally one of the most brilliant defenders of the truth of the gospel, how did it not translate into his behavior, right? And, and if it's true, it, it appears... Um, know enough about inside information on that one to believe that it is true. And, and if there is a problem, your own organization should be the ones that are calling you out on it, right? That, that's how it should be, and that's what happened. And it doesn't mean that what he was teaching was wrong. It just means that there wasn't this full integration of everything he knew in, his, in the theory part into his body, and his body controlled him more than the knowledge of the word did. And that's a real wake-up call, isn't it? So it's not a matter that we'll never sin again. It's a matter of when we recognize it, are we able to cut it off? If King David, when he was up on the, on the rooftop and looked over that edge and saw Bathsheba, if he had just turned his back and walked away, what a different story we would have had, right? But he didn't. There was, a, there was something in the immune system that the devil found a weakness, and he stayed and he lingered a little too long. He wrote the Psalms. 
He was in the cave, could have killed Saul and got convicted for just cutting a little piece off his robe. And yet here was a besetting sin that was still in his root system that brought the whole country down. Take down the leader. You get the people who follow him too, often. 